Every day, millions of people wake up to a refreshing cup of coffee. Last year alone, around 10 million tons of coffee were produced all over the world. From South America to South Asia and everywhere in between. I sometimes wonder, what would life be like without that refreshing cup of coffee? Sarah Jane Dias, actor, musician, model, and above all, an ardent coffee lover. In my travels around the world, I've discovered some truly unique coffees, and I'm always on the lookout for new varieties. It is one such coffee that led me on a trail from the beautiful city of Paris all the way back to my homeland, India. Born in the lush Araku Valley of the Eastern Ghats, this coffee has turned out to be more than just beans. It also has the dreams of an entire tribal community at its heart. Join me as I discover the little details of what makes Araku so special in what is India's largest certified organic fair trade biodynamic coffee plantation. of France. A vibrant kaleidoscope of love, art, food, cinema, literature and culture. Given the French and their love for the good life, I have found some of the world's finest coffees available right here. And so this is where I begin my coffee trail. My morning coffee ritual literally sets the tone for my day. And because of that, what coffee I drink is very important. So I'm always on the lookout for new varieties. On my last trip to Paris, I discovered a coffee that I absolutely fell in love with. But little did I know that that coffee comes all the way from India. Nestled in the eastern ghats of Andhra Pradesh is a little known valley where our unique coffee comes from. It is so aptly named Araku. So in my quest to find out more about Araku coffee, I found myself here at their Paris store. Bonjour Marie. Oh, nice to meet you. Hi. Bienvenue chez Araku. Oh, thank you. coffee uh, and it's cultivated by Adivasi farmers which uh, and the, the whole coffee changed their life over the last 15 years so it's amazing. The fact that this coffee is made by tribal farmers was unknown to me. As Marie regaled me with their stories she also treated me to a refreshing cup of this socially conscious coffee. Oh wow. You like it? Yes. I'm also told that the Araku story is incomplete without this key person who is behind the entire initiative, Mr. Manoj Kumar. Actually, the journey started 20 years ago, almost. What we did is went to that region and found that the British was growing coffee there from 1900, and the Adivasi said nothing to do with it. But as we spoke, we felt that what they needed was from being untouched into this nature, and the coffee estate, they wanted this coffee to be their legacy. So we said, why don't we get these Adivasis to create world-class coffee so that 
it transforms them economically but also changes the entire region into an ecological wonderland so in essence you've given these people something to call their own and you've given them a way to earn a livelihood that's incredible especially for the adivasi community you have to go to arakko to see it I you really will see want to. micro plots an entire family giving their everything to that and tendering to each of the plant each of the cherry you have to see that it's it's a, it's a very detailed story i mean it's not i won't do justice talking about it mari and manoj opened my eyes to the story of arakko with their passion and enthusiasm and i've decided to head back to india to trace the story to its roots to witness the lives of the adivasis for myself and the change brewed by this coffee the fastest flight from paris to mumbai takes about 8 hours from there it would take me almost as long to get to the remote yet picturesque arakku valley about 900 miles away Straddling the Andhra Pradesh and Odisha border Arakku is part of the Eastern Ghats of India and is approximately 1000 meters above sea level. The nearest airport to Arakku is about 60 miles away in Visakhapatnam. Winding roads lead up to what is now slowly becoming a hot spot for tourism. As I drive into the valley, I'm welcomed by a sight to behold. I was told that the valley was once denuded and desolate. But these lush views that greet me, they tell a different tale. The hills are beautiful, come rain or shine. But it didn't always used to be this way. This thriving biodiversity and this lush green that you see was not always the same. And if this is what it looks like right now, I cannot wait to find out what the story was that took it from being barren to this beautiful. I'm here in Arakku Valley, the second stop on my coffee trail. I can't wait to discover more about the Arakku coffee, especially the economic and social turnaround it's created for the communities living here. This story is going to be about witnessing change. A story of change from the very grassroots with its impacts reaching the other side of the world. in the beautiful Arakku Valley and I'm starting another day of my coffee trail with a mission to go behind the scenes of Arakku coffee and see how this socially conscious coffee is grown I'm inspired to know that this coffee is grown by the tribal farmers and I'm keen to discover the secrets behind its making that landscapes rainfall microclimates and even the plants in the surrounding areas impact the overall taste of a coffee and today i'm meeting with the people who help transmit this science onto the field when it comes to the art of coffee growing david hogg can be called the guiding light hello hi how are you too Welcome to Arakku. Nice to meet yeah. you, David. An expert in regenerative agriculture and soil carbon restoration, he has been an integral part of the story of Arakku coffee and has helped make it what it is today. 
Now, I'm super excited to talk to David, um, and I was doing a bit of reading, and the thing that stood out to me the most was a term that was used, which was bio-agriculture. Now, I've heard of organic agriculture. Tell me, what, what's, what's the difference? What is it? Okay, so it's kind of like um, one step up from um, sort of regular organic agriculture. Right. It's, it's, it's kind of, you, you might say it makes organic agriculture work. Right, okay. Um, so it, it's those little amendments, um, somewhat like the bark remedies, the flower remedies. We actually use flowers. We grow chamomile, we grow yarrow, we grow all of these flowers and we use certain minerals and we we ferment them and then we add them to our composts and add them to our biofertilizers and that brings out the nuances. It attracts the nutrients that will make your coffee special. This is the largest organic certified fair trade coffee plantation. Is that true? Yes. When I first began here, we had 500 farmers. It grew and then as we got the marketing organized, we took in more and we've grown now to 10,500 farmers. Yeah. Wow, that's so, amazing. Yeah. So how does the bioagriculture go into making this? So. It's a, it's a mixture of, of art and science. And combined with that, there's the, the social element because we have to work with every farmer. David told me about some of the groundwork and hard research that was done before arriving at the unique solutions for growing coffee here in Araku. This detailed groundwork, including the terroir classification and soil sampling, helped to ascertain the perfect conditions and methods that would yield the finest of coffees. Over 20,000 acres mapped and studied to allow the agricultural experts to find solutions and then pass on this scientific knowledge to the Adivasi farmers. This in turn helps them produce coffees of such high quality on ground. I can't wait to get to the fields. It will be my first time in a sustainable coffee farm. The man who helps translate David's curated organic solutions to the farmers is Vinod. He will be joining us as we visit the farms to show me how they grow their coffee. This is incredible. So there's so, our coffee landscape here. Can you see the see the amount of diversity here, and you see the different shade, different uh, striata of shade. You know, some high shade. There is some uh, a very high shade, what we call primary shade, and then there's secondary shade. And each one of these filters the sunshine to give a particular kind of quality of light for the coffee beans. This region is made only for Arabica. Okay. This region is not um, good for um, robusta. Oh. Is there are many people grow robust in other uh, part of in India, but this part is only made for Arabica. There also is called Arabica 795 yeah. or Selection 9. Yeah. Compared to all other places, here we um, trained our people only harvest selective cherry to take it to the final um, selected cherries into our processing. Oh, of course. One of the key differences that make Araku coffee so unique comes from the harvesting of the cherry because each tribal family owns and looks after just one acre, they carefully handpick only the ripest cherries, whilst more commercial operations might have to pick a mix as they cannot afford to harvest multiple times. It's just such differences of micromanagement that allow Araku coffee to truly stand out. So I noticed, and I can't say I'm too happy about this, but there are a lot of insects around, but I'm guessing that's also necessary to yep. maintain the, the, the symbiotic uh, relationship Absolutely. between, you know, now, all you the will trees. have noticed the, the, the plethora of, of spiders. And the whole point of our um, ecologically friendly coffee is the fact that we know that if we only have to go through one time with a, with a toxic spray, yeah. and we decimate the entire population, the beneficials yeah. as well as what we're trying to kill. It's just that, that chain of reactions yeah. that you set off yeah. when you use those pesticides, yeah. it, it does enormous damage yeah. to, 
to the environment as well as our environment. You're encouraging nature to do its own thing. It's sort of flourishing and thus production is increasing. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. These man-made functional forests give me hope and are truly special. On the one hand, they have healed this once denuded landscape and revived its biodiversity, while on the other hand, they've provided its people a bounty of premium coffee that is a blend of modern science and age-old farming wisdom of the community itself. So that was beautiful. And I wanted to know, how does the farmer's traditional knowledge contribute to the farming yes. process? The farmers actually um, here is that they are following this um, sustainable, uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, traditionally, they are growing on the traditional yeah. culture. And also, they grow so intercrops such as like as a mango, jackfruit, yeah. tamarind, yeah. banana. It's uh, so many uh, multiple shade crops. Okay. Then itself shows the results. Wow. And not only that, they also follow their own uh, cosmos calendar. Oh. And that calendar is, you know, part of it reflects the cosmic rhythms, and we, uh, they, every one of them has it in their home. So I really? can, I can show it to yeah, you, I and, and we can one. describe what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. So this is like traditional knowledge made into a modern version, so that everyone can follow it. Okay. And uh, just to give you a rundown on the basics of it, all these sort of the golden -y period, this is what they call the ascending moon. Yes. When the moon is in a certain phase. Yes. Then this dark phase is the descending moon. Yes. So the activity is like you germinate seeds in this period. Here you would transplant. Anything to do with under the ground, right. with the arrow pointing down, is where we do the activity. So the farmers, they all know that their, their month is organized according to these rhythms. To the moon? Uh, to the moon. And it's astonishing that people forget these things. Yeah. Um, and it's nice that it's still alive. You know? Yeah, and so we recreated this in a modern way and everyone, that they all refer to it, they all have it on their walls and Amazing. we made it kind of nice and easy to follow. And, and, and you took them through the calendar and explained what symbol meant what yeah. and how, and now they just follow yes, it. Yes, and they follow it. That's and amazing. So question, where did the original calendar come from? The original thing was actually inspired from India. Okay. Then there was a gentleman called Rudolf Steiner that got hold of it and said, right. hey, look, this traditional knowledge is, is the truth. Yes. You know? So he then started using it. Then it came back to India, and then we modernized it by putting it into this kind of symbol. We call it the cosmic subsidy. Got it, got it. Walking through the traditional yet sustainable farms, being here in the village, for me, is a peek into an age-old culture. It's amazing to see that this traditional wisdom is still alive today. On my coffee trail, I have witnessed the science behind the growing of this Araku coffee. I have seen the flourishing ecology and a glimpse of its caretakers, the Adivasi farmers. It's now time to delve deeper into their story. Coffee is weaved into the very fabric of life for the Adivasi farmers who inhabit the villages of Araku Valley. But this was not always so. Trouble started during the English settlement, when the land was transformed into plantations of cash crops that the locals didn't traditionally understand, including coffee. It proved to be unsuccessful and in the bargain, these communities lost their traditional ways of life and their verdant landscape. That Araku Valley is lush and blooming today is a reminder of those early years before the landscape and its people were subject to destitution. The government returned these lands to their rightful guardians. And it was only around 20 years ago when Nandi Foundation stepped in to help the situation and empower the Adivasi farmers 
once again. One of the main people responsible for these better times is Anupama, a leading force of the Nandi Foundation. Passionately working to not only help more than 12,000 farmers grow world-class coffee, but also empowering them to revive their way of life. So, you'd be surprised to know this, but I've actually had Aruku coffee before. Where did you? In Paris which is how I discovered it for the first time. And that's what brought me here, because I really wanted to come to the heart of where it was made and find out about it. So I'd love to know more about the process, just what makes it so different and gives it its unique flavor, which it clearly has. So uh, in Araku, uh -huh. our, in our particular coffee, uh -huh. there is a family farming. Okay. And women play a very active role, right from the farm management to pest control and to harvesting. Oh my God, I love this coffee even more right now. So there are like women in the fields with the process of growing and further or just yes. the farming? Oh wow. No, I'm including the reap the economic benefits of the producers really? as well. Wow. That Araku coffee has uplifted the lives of the Adivasi women and empowered them is a story that I want to find out more about. Anupama has already made a plan for me to meet one of the ladies who makes this coffee even more special. This particular farmer's story is an inspiring tale of empowerment. A widowed Adivasi farmer who against all odds raised six children on her own all thanks to farming coffee. Sinanam garu, nenu un batti ulsa puttindi, ha? Sarena, ekkada ochchanu, ikkada cheskunnan pilli, ikkada cheskunnan. Alaga memu appar nunchi ikkada cheskunnam alaga yesam pan chestunnam. Yesam ante pollal panni, inka garul panni dukki cheskoni batukutunnam. Apuru apunanche maina mape mu mupa sama sama pelisus kuni chani pade ma barta. But how did she know how to grow coffee? De ma ke na di tar punanche serving se ser saran. Tar bata maina ke akara Bengaluru lo. Training is skilled, sir. Uh -huh. Ah, training is skilled. Okay. Upon the Akanunci, Nerskoni, Alantipani, Mame could assess the Baba Taikos Tamu and Isi, Adam Matal for him, sir. Can you ask her um, before Nandi came in? I want to know, like, can she tell me how much she used to earn before and how much she earns now? Samasram Ki and Kavalsulu Pante, Padivil. What? I also want to work. I'm coming to work with her in the field. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was heartening to hear Sundarama's story and to meet her in person. She has not only survived the loss of her husband and the task of raising six children on her own. But thanks to the family farming and the inputs from the Nandi Foundation, she seems to be doing well for herself. This is a reflection of not only her strength and courage, but also the changes that this social enterprise has made in their lives. In fact, there are signs of prosperity everywhere. Improved housing, electricity, communication, 
paved roads, schools, and healthcare services, these Adivasi farmers are finally getting equal opportunity. To me, this is a true cup of change. For the people, they have their forests back, their water, their land, and most of all, their culture is beginning to thrive again. And thrive they do. The shy smiles and bold jewelry reflect a proud community that is warm and welcoming of those unknown to them. And I am about to sample their hospitality, a legacy dish called the Bungalow Chicken, unique to this area. They are good in preparing, uh, preparing uh, bamboo chicken. Which is the specialty of this region. Specialty of the region. Cooked in a bamboo that is locally available, this experience is a spicy one. But it is also refreshing to see food being prepared so organically. Now I know what you're thinking, but I have actually legit been here for 45 minutes salivating while watching this process happen and I refuse to leave because I must be the first person who tastes it as soon as it's ready. This is it, this is the moment. Uh, this is bamboo chicken. My travels are never complete without tasting some local dishes. And so this one, I must have. The bamboo chicken is chala bounty. Thank you, madam. After having met the ancient tribes of Araku, I'm reminded yet again of how heavily we rely for sustenance on our environment. And I'm so thrilled to witness firsthand that there are still people working every single day to keep our environment safe and make sure that all the agriculture is sustainable. And I also feel that we live in a generation and an age where sustainability is a word that's just thrown around and it's not really taken very seriously. But right here, at a place that's pretty much a part of our roots, people are taking that very seriously. And the inspiration for the sustainability is actually coming from our own culture. So I'm really thrilled to be here. To inspire the farmers, I was told about an initiative in the form of a competition for the farmers known as the Gems of Araku. Mr. Chris Gopala Krishnan, one of the founding members of Tech Group Infosys, has been instrumental in bringing this coffee to the international stage. There's a beautiful story behind Araku coffee. You know, the coffee that's grown by Adivasis in the Araku Valley, uh, who you know, originally, of course, were um, living off the forest. Now they have a livelihood, now they have an income stream, their children are going to school. I think this story resonates with the consumers. So the coffee is, of course, very good quality, but there is a story behind the coffee. The Adivasis were also, um, you know, rewarded, incentivized, and they're also made to feel proud of what they have been able to achieve. Uh, the competition, the Gems of uh, Araku, indeed helps us in actually getting this message across to the uh, Adivasis. And I felt that uh, since the coffee was anyway exported, why don't we make an attempt to create a brand? Why don't we have a physical presence in the market? And why don't we create a story around high quality coffee grown out of India? And that's the beginning of uh, our journey into getting into retail in uh, France. From Paris to Araku, it's been quite a journey of discovery. And it goes to show how a social enterprise can really impact lives on a big scale. The farmers here thrive off the land today, the same way they once used to.
It's day four on my journey into Araku Valley. And so far, my coffee trail has revealed a whole lot more than just coffee. I have witnessed the change that Araku coffee has ushered for the tribal farmers, their economy and their environment. So now that I've seen the beautiful valley of Araku and where the coffee comes from and how it gets made, I'm on my way to the central processing unit where all the magic happens. Vinod is taking me on a tour of the central processing unit where the final beans of Araku coffee are processed. So I drink a lot of coffee, but I actually have no idea what the process is of how coffee gets made. Now I am aware that you're very um, particular about the only the ripest fruit that's picked yeah. um, and that's brought here yes. and then what happens? Here put all the they produce here uh -huh. we call organic certified coffee okay then we open the fresh water okay we soak it in the water for a few minutes uh -huh. then it's way of it's rinsing uh -huh. then after that we open the gate here right it goes for um, siphon siphon time further process but how much coffee fruit is in here it's per day it can be so thousand kg kilograms but it can be more than 10,000 kilograms. I'm sorry, did you say per day? Per day, yes. Wow, I want to go swimming in it. After uh, siphoning, mm -hmm. this comes for pulping. Pulping mm -hmm. part is more important. Okay. It's uh, making separation of seed and skin. Right. When the same processed coffee is called pulping, after the pulping, seed is comes and through the, this channel, it mm -hmm. goes for fermentation. Okay. And the skin is goes other side. It's we have taken it, uh, taken that one for compost making. Uh -huh. That all skin is taken it for compost making. Right. And this goes to the field again. So the whole fruit is used yes. basically. Once after the fermentation gets over, we take it through this channel. Uh -huh. This goes for washing. Right. There also it's happened. Washing also it's happened with the natural water. Okay. Natural fresh water. Uh -huh. Then after that we taking it for drying. Okay. We call it raised beds. Right. So it will get the air from the natural air from the bottom as also it takes the um, um, air from the breathing from the top side. Okay. So evenly drying is more important. Uh huh. Then the, after the drying only it goes for roasting. And then the tasting. Then only you can um, figure it out the taste. It's evident that making a good cup of coffee is a lot of hard work. To churn out a coffee of international standards, the smallest detail counts. Through all the hardships of a tribal society, struggling to find meaning in a modern world, the last two decades have been miraculous for the people of Araku. My time in Araku has come to an end, but I have come to realize that thanks to a humble cup of coffee, all the dreams of prosperity are now emerging as a reality for the Araku coffee farmers. I'm back in Mumbai and I have the opportunity to interview another illustrious figure. This man is a stalwart famous for the Mahindra automobiles industry. I am interviewing Mr. Anant Mahindra himself and I cannot begin to explain how privileged and how honoured I feel. Mr. Anand Mahindra is also on the board of trustees for Araku Coffee. So I'm actually very interested in seeing what his point of view is of how this humble product became world famous. My name is Sarah Jane. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure sir. to meet you. Thank you for taking the time. My honor. So, 
Mr. Mahindra, I've been to Aruku myself and I've met with the farmers and I've witnessed firsthand this product becoming what it is as something that is produced in the remotest part of the country to this wonderful finished product that is now world famous. Tell me, how did you get involved? You know, uh, I joined the Araku board out of fascination for the very wide spectrum of philanthropic activities that they were undertaking. But the one that intrigued me was their effort to help Adivasi farmers in the Araku Valley move out of subsistence farming. But while doing that, they had uh, built one of the finest coffees in the world. So in one of my uh, brainstormings with the board and with Manoj Kumar, the dynamic CEO of uh, Nandi, we were talking about what to do next with Araku. And what struck me was that Araku had the potential to become a global brand. Mm. So I remember a very interesting, breezy uh, brainstorming session once where I said, look, why don't we turn this into a social enterprise? Right. And the reason I made that suggestion was because I truly believe that the future of philanthropy is not in writing checks. It is really in building social enterprises which are sustainable, a kind of shared value concept. And that's what we set out uh, to do with Araku and uh, as, I, as you know, the rest is history. Yes. But tell me, so did they, in the actual product, was there a demand for some kind of coffee like this and is that why the coffee was so interesting to you? You know, when you go out to uh, deliver the best in the world of anything, yes. there's no shortage of demand. Yes. The best brands in the world are nothing but an accumulation of stories, yes. as I've said very often. Yeah. And Haruku had a wonderful story. Yeah. So when you drink that coffee, yeah. we are not asking you to compromise on your requirements for good taste. Yes. But when you sip it, yeah. there's an extra something you get. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you. My journey has come full circle because I'm now going to head back to Paris. And having traced the journey of Araku from bean to cup, I fully understand why this bean is part of such a powerful cup of change. I'm back in Paris, but my coffee trail isn't entirely complete. I was yet to see how the green beans sent from the hills of Araku transform into a coffee powder of international reputation. I'm here to meet with a master roaster who would explain the final transformation of the bean, the final alchemy that brings out the flavors that make it a truly world-class coffee. I organize for you uh, a cupping. Okay. And what we do today, it's cupping the coffee you've seen in Harku Valley, okay? So it's a cupping of each plant. I will put so mm -hmm. for four minutes. Okay. okay. We can we can do also three minutes. So okay. we have a thermometer there. Okay. For be sure for having the right temperatures. It's like a sort of being fun, but it's only. And now we are in time. Are we ready? So take your spoon. Okay. Look at me. I have my spoon. You have a glass of water, okay. hot water to do, so okay. you can rinse. Okay. And just do like this. And you push. And it's three times, okay? okay. And after you can smell the spoon too. And smell. Oh my god, that smells amazing. <laughs> so, what we could look for in cupping is well, the main defect, but here in Haraku we have no main defects, okay? So, the other thing, the main thing, it's the balance. Balance means the acidity versus sweetness. Okay. People love sweetness, and in Haraku we have a very, very sweet coffee, so it's amazing for that. But sweetness without acidity doesn't exist, and acidity without sweetness 
It's very hard, it doesn't exist. It was. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> okay, I show you again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay? Cool. I mean, no, because it's a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, better. Awesome. <laughs> so, what we do in Araku, it's for each kind of terroir, we have a different coffee. And so my uh, job is to understand the quality, to improve the quality, okay, but to blend all the coffee They've come from different plots. Got it. Okay. okay. So it's a big mix of yeah. different plots, but based on terroir, on climates. Okay. okay. So what we call microclimates. Okay. So it's amazing. And I'm also yeah. really grateful to have been able to witness Aruku coffee go from its humble origins back home to becoming one of the finest coffees in the world. And witnessing this, the final transformation process, when you get to smell all the aromas and find all the little nuances in the tastes. And I have to say that this definitely lives up to my first-hand experience of a cup of change. So, thank you again. Merci beaucoup. I have come to the end of my coffee trail. From cup, to the farm, to the bean and back. A story that has not only taught me the many nuances that go into growing coffee, but the many facets of growing a socially conscious product. The landscape, the flavors, the culture, the passion of its people, and the solid support of the socially conscious industrialists, all coming together to make a coffee so strong and so powerful that it, in return, has helped bring change and the betterment of the families of Araku Valley. When you have a chance, try a cup of Araku. It'll definitely become your new favorite. For me, this journey has been a humbling one. I've kind of gone full circle. And it's been a really rewarding experience for me because I've had a chance to meet the wonderful people behind this coffee. A coffee that has managed to single-handedly change the lives of an entire community and the environment in which they live. And coffee connoisseurs around the world will agree that this is a refreshingly different coffee that is a cup of change from India to the world. <laughs>